Okay, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, you probably think there's only four verses in that chapter, since for three weeks we've only looked at verses 1 through 4. But we're going to move on beyond that. There's actually 58 verses in that chapter. And, uh, but we're going to begin to look at verses 5 through 11, and that's, we're just going to begin at that point. But there's a, a connection of all those verses. So I'm going to begin reading for our scripture reading in verse 3. And I start there because it's the beginning of the sentence, and I'll bring that out as I begin to teach. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that He was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remaineth unto the present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and the grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we do pray that we might understand uh, the importance of the things that Paul continued to say after the gospel as we study this today. And as we think uh, about the, the salvation that's ours through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the absolute truth of the faith that we believe. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. This section, the reason I read verses 3 through 11, first of all, uh, we've been stopping at, verse, at the end of verse 4 to talk about the gospel that Paul preached uh, for the last few weeks. Uh, but I, was, I, I probably said it on Sunday, I know I said it on a Wednesday, that I received a phone call from a man who watched our TV program, or under, it might have been a, our, our own videos, that has first, he finally came to understand salvation, and he was just thrilled to death, but he wanted to make sure he got it right. And what his question was, do I have to believe that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, in order to be saved? Because he pointed out to me, and I had seen it because I've been studying the passage, is that verse 3 begins the sentence, and it doesn't end until the end of verse 6. And so he wanted to make sure he believed all the gospel to make sure he was saved because what Paul delivered was not just that Christ died for our sins uh, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, but Paul continued to say, and he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of which the greater part remained unto the present, but some are fallen asleep, period. So when Paul delivered that, he delivered, that's the sentence he delivered. And the man wanted to make sure that he believed what God wanted him to believe so that he could declare what verses 1 and 2 say. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. And he wanted to make sure that he is saved because he believed what Paul delivered. And uh, my statement to him is that the believing the gospel is believing verses 3 and 4. But the verses 5 and 6 is the support of the fact that Jesus Christ did rise from the dead. If you believe that he was buried, that he died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, you automatically believed verses 5 and 6 without realizing that there is a testimony about his resurrection. The reason Paul did that is to verify the fact of resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a verified bona fide truth. It's not just blind faith on our part. It, it is a recorded fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, none of which can be refuted. And we'll point that out as we look at scriptures here and, uh, and, and see that fact. And so Paul not only talked about the resurrection of Christ, he gave evidence about the resurrection of Christ, and it doesn't end in verses 5 and 6. It continues that evidence. The witnesses continue all the way down to verse 8, and then... Uh, and then in verses 9 through 11 is the uh, effect of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
So that what we have here in those 11 verses is a witness and a personal effect of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul not only is the last one to have seen the resurrected Lord, but seeing the resurrected Lord transformed his life. And that's part of the testimony of the resurrection. And so Paul starts giving these witnesses, and it's not just two sets of witnesses, but Paul will actually, in this section here, verses 5 through 8, will list six sightings of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it's important that we realize that, that the, the Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection is a fact. It's not just a superstition, a hopeful thing, but it's a verified fact. In fact, what we're going to do before I even continue on in 1 Corinthians 15, I want to talk to you about the resurrection of the Lord. Go back to Acts chapter 1. And there, Paul gave six in 1 Corinthians 15 evidences of Jesus Christ's resurrection. Without his resurrection, there is no salvation. Without his resurrection, you're yet in your sins. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is important to the gospel and believing the gospel in order to be saved. Otherwise, you can't believe in a dead Savior. Although there's a lot of people that have religion that their leader is dead with no hope of resurrection. Uh, but Christianity is different than every other religion in the whole world that we believe in a Savior who died, was buried, and rose again so that his words are verified and that his, the hope that we have in him of forgiveness of sin and resurrection from the dead. He, he said in John, because I live, ye shall live also. The, the, the verification of his words is the fact that he rose from the dead. Now, as I said, Paul's going to list six, but there's a lot more even in Scripture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the sightings of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you begin the book of Acts, Luke, who wrote the book, says this in verse 1. He says, The former treatise have I made thee, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now that's a reference that Luke is writing. When you read Luke chapter 1, you find out that this is Luke writing to Theophilus, just like the book of Luke is written to him. But Luke, the gospel of Luke, was only the beginning of what Jesus began both to do and to teach. That's recorded in the book, what he called the former th treatise. That he's referring to the book of Luke. Then in verse 2 it says, Until the day in which he was taken up, after that, he, uh, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. That's the book of Acts. So the book of Luke is what Jesus began to do and to teach, and then the book of Acts is what he continued to teach the apostles through the Holy Spirit. And that's where the book of Acts is going to pick up the Holy Spirit coming. And this is the time in which the Lord told them He's going to guide them into all truth. He's going to show them things to come. And so there is more that, that the Lord Jesus Christ taught even after He ascended back into heaven. And the book of Luke continues the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ through the twelve apostles and the revelation that was given to them. And then we see that new apostle coming on the scene and his revelation in Romans 13, uh, Romans Romans through Philemon. So, the verses 1 and 2 of the book of Acts refer to the book of Luke and the book of Acts. When he talked about uh, the, after that in verse 2, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he hath chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, after his suffering on the cross, by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Not only did he continue to teach them, but when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he, was on, he walked on this earth for another forty days. It wasn't like some men just said, I think I saw him. And then, yeah, I, I think I saw him too. No, it was many infallible proofs. Infallible proofs meaning you can't argue against it. There's been so many witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And by the way, even historically written, uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that it is undeniable. And, and it's an important part of the gospel and an important part of our faith. So he, wa he was seen of them uh, after his passion by many infallible proofs. Being seen of them forty days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So that the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is recorded in Scripture. You know, you might recall that if you read the Gospel accounts, it's, it always sounded strange to me, and I didn't quite understand it for a while. 
And that is, many times, like the Lord, for instance, when Peter, we told him he's going to go to Jerusalem, die, and rise again the third day, Peter said, far be it from you, Lord, this won't happen to you. And after he got done talking to them about that, he said, tell, tell no man I'm the Christ. Well, I thought that's what they were supposed to preach. <laughs> uh, if you go, just, just the words, tell no man, several miracles that he did, he would instruct the person he did the miracle to, tell no man, tell no man. And, and then, and then uh, even after the fact where Peter finally acknowledges, he says, who, who, who do men say I am? And then the Lord asked Peter, um, who do you say I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, tell no man that I'm the Christ. They go to the Mount of Transfiguration. They come down and they say, he says, tell no man what you saw until after I'm risen from the dead. And the reason for that is it says in Matthew chapter 20, uh, no, chapter 12, it says, uh, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it except the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonah was in the whale three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. His resurrection is the final proof that he was the Messiah of Israel, God who came down in the flesh. It is the evidence, it's at that point, that they go out and preach, Jesus is the Christ. Because now the final proof, you want proof of that? His resurrection is the proof of that. And it's after that, in the early Acts period, that's what they're going out and preaching, that Jesus is the Christ, and the many infallible proofs support the fact that who Jesus Christ is. Now Paul builds on that, as we know, we've been studying 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, and Paul adds why Jesus Christ died. Not that he just died and was buried and rose again, but why? He died for our sins, according to Scripture. He was raised for our justification. Salvation is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Salvation from the penalty of our sins. And, and so uh, there's these many infallible proofs, and then... Um, what my point in reading here in Acts is I'm going to take you through some because when we taught the book of Mark, <laughs> I, I came across a verse that was kind of helpful to me because if you study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it is very difficult to figure out who saw them, when did they see them, where were they, and what order was this? There's so many appearings of the Lord Jesus Christ after the resurrection, and, and every gospel account ends with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and, and appearing, but they don't all match. And you scratch your head trying to figure out, okay, where are they, where were they? You know, for instance, when the Lord, before he, he died, he told them that he's going to die and rise again, and I'll meet you again in Galilee. And then, uh, and then when the angel appeared to the women, they said, go and tell him that the Lord is risen. The angel said this. Go and tell him the Lord is risen and that he'll meet them in Galilee as he had said. But you know, the first appearing of the Lord was not in Galilee. <laughs> Galilee is Matthew chapter 16, and that's sometime after, not the first day of resurrection. The Lord Jesus Christ died outside of Jerusalem. He was buried, and the people there were in Jerusalem when he first appeared unto them. So when I, I say these things to you to get your mind thinking, that when it says many infallible proofs, walking among them for 40 days, there's many appearings of the Lord Jesus Christ in those 40 days, which verify the fact that he, it's infallible, that he did indeed rise from the dead. Paul's going to read list six, and none of them are the six that I'm going to mention to you right now. So go, the one that was helpful to me is the book of Mark, chapter 16. Everybody does this. Some say we should never do it. You can't hardly help yourself from doing it if you study the four Gospels. And that is to try to put the order of the whole life of Christ. When did he do this? When did he do that? When did he go to Galilee? When did he come down to Jerusalem? And try to put the three years of his life's ministry together. It's very difficult. All kinds of people have tried to do it. They never agree with each other. Uh, so it does seem a little bit on the feudal side, but at the same time, it's a great study because it makes you dig and dig and dig and try to compare verses. Uh, and the reason I say that, even if you take just the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't hardly put it together. But you have this at, at, the, at the end of Mark, Mark chapter 16 uh, and verse 9. It says, 
Now when Jesus was risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast, out, uh, cast seven devils. Well, I thought, oh, wow, finally. <laughs> he tells me how to start. The first person to see him was not the group of women, but it was Mary Magdalene all by herself. You know, when you read other accounts, you begin to realize that Mary Magdalene went even before those other women went to the tomb. Uh, but anyhow, the, he tells you first it was Mary Magdalene. Verse 10 says, And she went and told them that had been with him as they uh, mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. <laughs> After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went on, uh, into the country. Now that's, we talk about the two on the road to Emmaus. So after he appeared to, to Mary Magdalene, after that he appeared to those two on the road to Emmaus, and it says in verse 13, and, when they were, uh, and, went, and they went and told it unto the residue, that is those apostles that were meeting in that room, neither believed they them. Afterwards he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. He told them, I'm going to rise. Mary Magdalene said, I saw him. He rose. They didn't believe her. The two came back from the road to Emmaus, said, we saw him. And they said, nah, we don't believe that. Then he appeared to them, and now they're going to believe because they're seeing him for themselves. It's interesting, as I say, when you put pieces together. It says in verse 14, after that he appeared unto the eleven. Well, I want you to think about who that 11 is and, and think about some verses. I'll show you how I, I think about these. But first of all, go over to Luke chapter 24 because this covers what we just read. Now here they're coming back from from the sepulcher, and angels meet them. Verse 10, it's not only Mary Magdalene, but there's a whole group of other women that are with them. So this is not just the, the soul appearing to Mary Magdalene. In verse 13, it begins by saying, And behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which is from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. I calculated that out. It's a little bit over six and a half miles away. So they're leaving Jerusalem. I don't know what time of day they left Jerusalem, but, but they left Jerusalem and they're walking six and a half, six and a half miles back to, the road, uh, back to Emmaus where they lived. And it says, And they talked together of those things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that, he should not, that they should not know him. So he's walking with them and he says, well, what are you guys so sad about? And don't you hear the Messiah? We thought he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And, and so he just keeps walking with them. He acts like he's going to go past Emmaus when they finally get home. And they said, no, no, you come and dine with us because it's late. It's even. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, verse 28. And they drew nigh unto the village where they went. And he made, he made as though he would have gone further. And they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is uh, toward even, evening, and uh, the day is far spent. And they went in and tarried. And when they broke bread, well, I'll just read it. And it came to pass, as they sat at meat with, with them, he broke bread and blessed it. And uh, he, no, he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and brake and gave to them, and their eyes were open, and they knew him, and, they, and he vanished out of their sight. So that's when they immediately go running back to Jerusalem. I say that because we know what time of day it is. It's evening. So he appeared early in the morning to Mary Magdalene. The two on the road to Emmaus, he's walking back with them. I don't know what time they started, but by the time they realized it was the Lord, it's even. And they got to go six and a half miles back to Jerusalem that very day and, and, and tell the apostles, and they did. We come to verse 36, it says, And as they spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And here they're terrified, and he tells them, No, you're not seeing a ghost. 
uh, its eye and he took, he took the fish and ate it in their presence so that they realize that a spirit hath not flesh and bones as they see him have. He is physically risen from the dead and yet he could disappear and reappear and he appeared many times and this is the time now remember they left Jerusalem they came back he's at Jerusalem at this point and and the, now the, the the 12 are seeing him but when we read that in Mark and it said the 11 I should say it that way the 11 are seeing him the 11 to me has to include Matthias and I'll show you why in just a moment but you got to come to Acts chapter 1 first Acts chapter 1. Now I was concerned that a lot of this is just stuff, stuff, <laughs> information that I compiled trying to put it all together. And whether you find this interesting or confusing, uh, cer certainly going to stir you up to, to look a little bit further into some things. But anyhow, it, it is, it is uh, a matter of scholastical teaching, so to speak. And, and yet, there is a reason that I'm sharing these things. That's more than just facts to be dug out. But the facts are important. The Bible's giving us these facts. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, we have the re record of Judas going out and hanging himself. And Peter referring to the Psalms in verse 20 there of Acts chapter 1, saying that it said that another take his bishopric, let another take his apostleship. So they're gonna, they had 12 apostles that the Lord chose, and now they're down to 11 apostles. And so in verse 21 it says, Wherefore of these men, so they're going to pick another person to replace Judas. Wherefore of these men which accompanied us all the time the Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus went uh, in and out among us, beginning at the baptism of John, unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So the qualifications for anybody to be a part of the 12 apostles, they had to start at the beginning of John the Baptist and be with all those disciples the whole time the Lord is, is traveling. They had to travel with the Lord. And when he ascended out of their sight, that they had to be standing there watching him ascend back into heaven. That, that's the only persons that would qualify to be one of the 12 apostles. Later on, we'll emphasize the fact that Paul is not qualified to be one of the 12 apostles. Saul of Tarsus, at this point, is a lost Jew who later, as they go out and preach, tried to stop them from naming the name of Christ. And uh, so the apostle Paul could not be one of the 12 apostles. But we'll verify that and talk about that several more times. But anyhow, it says, and verse 23, And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justus, and Matthias. And so they pray, they cast lots. In verse 26, they gave their, uh, forth their lot, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So Matthias took Judas's place. But when, I, when the Lord first appeared to them after those two came back from the road to Emmaus and appeared to the eleven, as it said there, the eleven included Matthias. It didn't include one of the other apostles. Come to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. In verse 19. No, I, don't, I want to start before that. Um, anyhow, Mary Magdalene, here, here she is. Uh, she goes to the sepulcher. She's weeping. Uh, I think verse 1, it says, On the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark. Now that's important because the other ones were, it was the dawning. And, and it was, but Mary Magdalene, she went real early. And, and she goes and she's an angel standing there, the, the, the stone rolled away, the angel standing there. And then uh, she was told that he's risen. It says, uh, verse 14, And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not it was Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seek thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou hast bore him hence, tell me 
where thou hast laid him, that I may take him away. Jesus said unto her, Mary, just the, the Lord say your name. Look what happened. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say master. Jesus said unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to thy brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my father and your father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that, that, that he had spoken these things unto her. So there's the, her testimony concerning that. So he did that. You know, it's interesting. And when you go to Matthew, you, you start reading about the group of women. And Mary Magdalene was among them holding the feet of the Lord Jesus. At this point, very early. The first appearing to Mary Magdalene, he said, don't touch me. I'm not yet ascended to the Father. The same, just hours after this, the women grab him by, the, by the, the feet and hold on to him. And he doesn't say anything against that. Because in that time period, he ascended to God the Father, probably presenting his blood before God the Father at the mercy seat of the, temp of the, of the temple in the, in the heavens, and then came back. He, he, so anyhow, he appears to Mary Magdalene. In verse 19 it says, Then the same day at evening, okay, that's how we studied it in Luke. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed, himself, uh, showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then the Lord said again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they shall be remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. The twelve apostles are given authority on this earth to forgive and, and retain sins of the people of Israel. And, you know, that's not something that's passed down through the popes. That's the, the apostles. The Lord said that directly to the twelve apostles that he had chosen. But, but you notice verse 11. It says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. 24. 24. Did I tell you the wrong verse? <laughs> verse 24. And Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was, with, was not with them when Jesus came. So, when Jesus appeared, and the Bible says he appeared unto the eleven, Matthias was there, but Thomas wasn't there. Watch this. The other disciple, therefore, the other disciples, therefore, said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of his nails, of the nails, and put my finger into the uh, print of the, the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, and the doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hand. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen me, yet have believed. I like that verse, don't you? We've never seen the Lord, but we receive the testimony of Scripture, the testimony of those who have seen him. Not only is there testimony in Scripture of people who have seen him for over 40 days, many appearances, but there's another kind of testimony these that have seen him in his resurrection, their lives have been changed. And, you know, that's, when you read that passage in Corinthians, Paul not only gives six listings of people who have seen the Lord after his resurrection, then he says, last of all, he was seen of me. And says, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and I labor more abundantly than they all. The, when the Lord appeared to Saul of Tarsus and made him Paul the apostle of the Gentiles, he totally transformed that man's life because he's seen the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And the point of when we talk about resurrection, sure, it's a, it's a fact. It's a verifiable fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. 
and those who have not seen and yet believe, the same belief that we have in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ can transform your life. That's what Romans chapter 6 is all about. Maybe we'll share that in a little bit. But, but I want you to see that here. First of all, the other thing about this is I always call this uh, undoubting Thomas. <laughs> Because the Lord said, thrust your fingers in my hand and thrust your hand in my side and see that it's I. And you never read that Thomas did it. Instead, what you read is verse 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Now, you know, Thomas acknowledged something there that's really important. Who is Jesus Christ? Well, we read a lot about him being Lord. But there's another part of him. He is God. He is the eternal God that came from everlasting. Paul says that uh, concerning him that he is the, he is the uh, why am I going to misquote that? In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ is God who took on human flesh so that he could die on the cross and pay for our sins and rise from the dead to be our Savior. And he rose from the dead in a, in a body. He bodily rose from the dead. So he is, he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, but he is God. It's important to understand who Jesus Christ is and understand his deity. You know, there's a lot of people like Jehovah's Witnesses, they keep ch trying to change their Bible and all. When, 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 the Lord, when Thomas said to the Lord, my Lord and my God, Jesus didn't rebuke him and say, oh, wait a minute, I didn't take the place of God the Father. I'm not God, I'm just Lord. Jesus stood there and is resurrected and accepted the worship of Thomas, who is acknowledging Jesus Christ as both his Lord and his God. Because Jesus Christ is God. He's part of that Godhead that we call the Trinity. Trinity is very hard to explain. I understand that. And I can't satisfy everybody's curiosity with an explanation. But the reason for that, I'm explaining God. Who can explain God? All you can do is read the scripture and understand that God made himself known in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who could deny the fact that the Spirit of God is God? And nobody denies that God the Father is God. But the Lord Jesus Christ is God. And that's the Trinity, and the Bible teaches that. And Jesus Christ acknowledged that by accepting the worship of Thomas at this point. But now Thomas becomes a believer. But that's eight days after the Lord Jesus Christ. That's another appearing that's not recorded in, the, in, the, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so when he appeared to the eleven... As they were in that room, the first that, that, that 11 had to include Matthias at the beginning of that. Now, two more things I want to share with you from the book of John. Come over to chapter 1 of John. John chapter 1. And when the Lord first began to to call out the apostles. Now, they were first disciples of John the Baptist. Uh, begin in verse 35. It says, Again the next day after John st uh, stood and, the two, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say by interpretation, Master, where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. Now notice this phrase, Simon Peter's brother. Now, that Simon is his name. He's going to gain the, the name Peter, but verse 41 says, He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, 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 which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus beheld him, uh, uh, be, 
beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonas, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Now, it's interesting, the, the name, his name is Simon, but he was called Simon Peter, and if you look down in verse 44, now Philip uh, was of Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. You always hear Peter called Peter. But when the first Lord first saw Peter, he says, thou, he called him Simon the son of Jonas, thou shalt be called Cephas. Now Cephas is Aramaic. It's funny that it's, it's like when there, there's a quotation, his, he's, he uses the Aramaic name. But when it's a written narrative in the scriptures, he's always referred to as Peter. But he's called Peter to his face, all, all the other accounts in the Gospels. Here's one account that he's called Cephas, and it's, when the, it's actually a quotation of the Lord. Both Cephas and Peter mean a stone. And it talks about the leadership that Peter is going to have among the twelve apostles. He's always been the leader of the twelve, the spokesman for the twelve. But he's first called Cephas, and he's never called Cephas again until you come to 1 Corinthians. All the way through, five times in 1 Corinthians, Paul keeps referring to Peter as Cephas. Remember how it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12 that everyone saith to you, I am, of, uh, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Apollos, I am of Christ. He, he called Peter Cephas. And, and all the way through he says, we have, I've made this to... Uh, anyhow, there's like five times I could take you back through 1 Corinthians 15, but we've been studying... Uh, 1 Corinthians, and we've been studying that. But five times he referred to him as Cephas. Interesting, come to Galatians chapter... Chapter 1 first. And Paul, after his conversion, he didn't meet any of the apostles. His whole point is, is that his, the doctrine that he preached, the gospel that he preached, he didn't get it from man, wasn't taught it by man. That's verses 11 and 12. And it wasn't until three years later that he finally goes and visits Peter to tell him about, uh, the first time, to tell him about his testimony. And, and so it says in verse, uh, uh, verse 17, he says, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. So he only had a short visit with Peter after three years after his conversion. And, and so uh, he goes and he, he appears to Peter and he goes to see Peter. So you come to chapter 2 and now it's Acts chapter 15 where Paul's going to go and communicate to all the apostles that gospel that he's preaching among the Gentiles. Verse, chapter 2 verse 1. Then 14 years after I went again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also and I went up by revelation. God told him to go and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which are of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So he goes to tell the apostles about the gospel that he's been preaching. He's already been out preaching now more than 14 years, and, and he goes to tell them that gospel he's preaching among the Gentiles. So as they begin to understand that, look at verse 7. It says, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So Paul received the gospel of the uncircumcision. Peter received the gospel of the circumcision. That is, salvation through the nation of Israel, according to God's prophetic program. But God stopped the clock gave Paul a message of the gospel of the cross, sent him out to preach to the Gentiles, and, and in doing that it's called the gospel of the uncircumcision. Salvation apart from the nation of Israel. Salvation apart, is, apart from Israel's salvation. Salvation directly through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel of the uncircumcision is. That's what we were reading in 1 Corinthians. But So the one was committed to Paul, the other to Peter. Then the explanation of who they go to in verse 8. For he that wrought effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. Peter was the apostle to the nation of Israel. Circumcision a sign of the covenant to the nation of Israel. The same was mighty in me toward the Gentile. Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. So again you have a reference to 
the, the, the gospel that was committed to Peter in verse 7 and Paul, and then the people that they ministered to, that their apostleship of, in verse 8. And again, Peter, he that wrought effectual in Peter. Then you come to verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. They realized God stopped their Jewish program. They're going to continue to minister to the believing redmen of Israel, but Paul should go to the heathen. Now they, but see, they finally perceived the grace that was given to Paul. Now that's, we emphasize that, and hopefully you understand that. The reason I went here... Why did verse 7 call, refer to Peter, verse 8 refer to Peter, and then verse 9 says James, Cephas, and John? Every time I read verse 9, I always remind pe people that Cephas is Peter. But he jumped, the, the, you know, he's talking about Peter and his apostleship to Israel. Now Peter, now remember when I say you find Peter's name in the narrative, the, in the narrative, Cephas is Aramaic. People in that part of the country spoke Aramaic. But the Bible is written in Greek. And Peter, the Aramaic way of saying Cephas, is Peter. So that in the, in the narrative, and then in, in the time where it was written down the conversations, he's referred to Peter. I say that because it's strange that one time the Lord referred to Peter as Cephas, but the Apostle Paul many times refers to Peter as Cephas, but not always. Sometimes he's calling him Peter, but sometimes, like in this case, it's Cephas who realized this, so it seems like there's a sense in which anybody reading this would realize Peter, Cephas, has understood who's Paul, what Paul's ministry is and gave him the right hand of fellowship that he's the apostle to the, to the heathen. And uh, so that's, that term Cephas is used in that verse 9. Uh, I just found that interesting, but the reason I share it, go back now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We finally get started, and that's all we're going to do. <laughs> Paul, when he went out, he had a special list of people. Six sightings he would refer to. We're only going to cover the first two and kind of do that even on, the, on a quick basis here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5. It says, And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. I think we'll just stop with verse 5, with those two. He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Well, again, the Apostle Paul being consistent with Corinthians, referring to Peter as Cephas. And we already realized what Cephas means, and anybody who spoke Aramaic would understand what it means. It means a stone. So when Paul would go out and share the gospel, one of the things he said, one of the first evidences that he would give about the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that he was seen of Cephas. And that's important. Because Peter was important. Cephas was important. He's a stone. And, and his testimony is important. He was a leader of the twelve apostles. And he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this isn't the order of the Lord's appearing. But it certainly his testimony means a lot. And it really actually meant too much to the Corinthians. I say that to you because remember 1 Corinthians 1.12? Where it says, it says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. And Paul then has to take four chapters to get them to recognize the fact that Peter never went to the Gentiles. Paul went to the Gentiles. And then he, then he says in chapter 4, be followers of me. He sends Timothy to them to teach his ways in Christ. Because they weren't to be, Peter was not their apostle. And yet they had, they had this, this, this uh, high esteem of Peter. So with that high esteem, the apostle Paul says concerning the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was seen of Cephas. That meant a lot. And it meant a lot to the testimony in history. And then, then after that, he was seen of the twelve. And we've already studied the part how he was seen of the twelve, whether that's a generic statement, because there's many times he was seen of the twelve, but it, it was a statement given to them that he not only was seen of Cephas, but he was seen of the twelve. So as you say in that chapter, chapter 15, verse 5, he was seen of the twelve, Judas was dead before the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Judas went out and hung himself. 
Interesting, by the way, in Luke chapter 24, Judas tried to undo his sin. He went to the priest and confessed his sin and gave money. And the priest could not receive death money, so they bought the potter's field for a burial place and fulfilled scripture when they didn't even know they were doing it. But Judas, in his repentance, never went to God with his sin. Judas went to a priest, tried to undo his sin. Remember when we talked about the gospel? You can't do anything to get rid of your sin. There's no confessions to priests. There's no money that you can pay. You're totally helpless in yourself to save yourself. Judas never knew. He should have turned to God just like Adam should have turned to God when, he, when, when, when Eve sinned. Instead of him following in that sin, he should have turned to God or even afterwards and looked to God for salvation. And God is the Savior. To bring that salvation, Jesus Christ went to the cross and died on the cross for sin. Instead, Judas went out and thought, I'll, I'll just get rid of my misery, I'll hang myself. And he went from the frying pan into the fire. He's called the son of perdition. He went to hell. He never turned to God for salvation. He tried to deal with it himself, and when he couldn't deal with it, he committed suicide. Suicide doesn't put you in hell. Not trusting Jesus Christ as your savior puts you in hell. But So he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And Paul's not one of the twelve. Matthias replaced Judas. He was numbered with eleven, and he's the twelve. And when you read that verse, it's really important to understand Paul's not one of the twelve apostles. We'll stress that in another message, but I want to close because we studied about this appearing to Cephas or to, to the twelve, not so much the one with Cephas, but I want to show you one that he did appear to Cephas and why Paul is mentioning it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Go to John chapter 21. Strange thing, I, I laid a bunch of foundation for you to realize this. When we studied John chapter 20, they were in Jerusalem, right? When you come to John chapter 21, it says, After these things Jesus showed himself again unto the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, on this wise showed he himself. Sea of Tiberias is the Sea of Galilee. They're not down in Jerusalem. When you come to John chapter 21, they're now back up in Galilee. And even after the appearing that took place in John 20, they're there, and it says, it names the people that were there, verse 2, and they were, get, they were together, Simon, Peter, and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Canaan uh, uh, in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, uh, and two others of his disciples. Now that's James and John are the sons of Zebedee. It says in verse 3, Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. And they said unto him, we go with thee. Now you need to understand, it was up in Galilee, they were fishers fishing, when the Lord called them and said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Now Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, and remember they didn't understand the death, burial, and resurrection. They thought he was going to be king in Jerusalem. So now they know he's alive, but they still don't have it together in their head. They go back into Galilee, and Peter says, I go fishing. When he says that, what he's saying, he says, I'm going back to my occupation. I'm going to quit being a disciple of the Lord, an apostle. I'm going to quit. He believed, but he's going to go back fishing. Well, verse 4 it says, And when it was morning, was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, and the disciples knew not that it was Jesus, until he did this thing with them. He told them, cast their net on the other side, and they pulled in so many fish, a particular number of fish. Then they knew it was the Lord. And so they came, they came and, and, and the Lord said, let's dine. Uh, verse 14 says, This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when he had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Now notice that phrase, Simon Peter. Remember, that's the narrative. His name is Simon, but they're going to call him Peter because he's a stone. But what did he say? Simon, son of Joseph, jo Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? These, the boat, the net, the fishes, fishing. And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my lambs. 
Forget about going to fish. He said unto him again the second time, notice what he's calling him, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, getting it deep into his heart, Peter, do you really love me? Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. So he's calling him back to the ministry of going out and witnessing to the nation of Israel. That's what he does in early Acts. Verse 18, Verily I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girded thyself, and walkest whither thou went, what wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall uh, uh, gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. What does he mean by that? This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Peter, from that point on, goes back and becomes the leader of the nation of Israel in the, the gospel of the circumcision. And he, is, he's, he comes up against the Jewish council. He comes up against the government. History records, and talk about stretching forth his hands, that Peter died on an X-shaped cross as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that he, he chose to be upside down. Now, I, I don't know if I believe all that. That comes out of history. But I believe this verse that there was going to be, when he's young, he chooses where he wants to go. When he's old, someone else is going to take him where he doesn't want to go. And the Bible says this is signifying by what means he's going to glorify God. He's going to be martyred. What changed his life? The resurrected Lord Jesus Christ appearing to Cephas changed his life. Blessed are thou, Thomas, because you've seen and believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, not only do you receive the gift of eternal life, but you're identified with his death, burial, and resurrection unto newness of life. And when you realize Jesus Christ indeed did rise from the dead, I am indeed saved from my sin, you look at this life from a whole different point of view, and it can transform your life. If you'll stop and let the Lord speak to you like he did with Peter, Lovest thou me, lovest thou me, lovest thou me, follow me. Paul says first that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Why did he start there? Because of the, the testimony that Peter had concerning his service for the Lord. After he one time denied him three times, now three times acknowledging, I love you, Lord. Let's pray. Our God and Father, I pray that you speak to every one of our hearts. We are thrilled the fact that we are saved from our sins. But Father, we serve a living Savior. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And Father, I pray that each one of us would search our own hearts concerning what we live for and who we live for. Thank you for saving us as a free gift but work in our hearts that we might serve you, knowing that our labor in vain, uh, labor in the Lord is not in vain, as Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15 will end. In Christ's name we pray it, amen.